All right. Welcome, 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 everyone. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon. Uh, this is a, a tradition at this point, and I'm going to vamp just a little bit and let everybody uh, everybody get logged on because it always takes just a couple minutes. But uh, this is a big uh, a big event this year. I mean, we normally do two official market updates. Of course, we're always updating our thinking on the markets, but two official updates throughout the year, one about halfway, which is this one, and then one to start the year uh, in January or sometimes February. But with all of the news going on lately, politically especially, um, it is a very hot time to kind of start thinking about where we are headed going forward here. And it is, I think, going to be in a lot of those areas, like the politics arena, which I will talk about the politics today, not about politics in and of itself, but about its impact on the markets, on investing and things like that. Um, but I'm also going to talk about AI, which was really our major kind of headline when we were putting this together. Um, how is AI going to affect the, the marketplace? And I have a couple of points I want to make on that beyond just the normal kind of taking stock of where things are. So thank you again, everybody, for being here. I'm going to make sure everything's pulled up correctly on my end. And um, what I want to get out of the way right at the beginning is just a little bit of housekeeping. So as always, with any of our events, you can look down, whether you're on your phone or on your computer, and there should be a button, a couple buttons. One that is a chat button, which that is just literal chat. There's also a Q&A button where you can ask a question directly to me. And Aaron's also helping out today, um, making sure that I catch all the questions. So you can put a question in the Q&A and then only I see it. So then I can answer it sort of, I guess, more anonymously then. Um, or there's even a raise your hand button. And I encourage you to use any and all of those as we go through. I may reserve the right to sort of table a question because, oh, I'm going to get to that. Give me a few minutes and I'll get to the next page here. Or we may just be able to tackle them at the end. So whatever, you know, we'll go with the flow here, but just know that those are options. And without further ado, then I'm sure there'll be a couple more people. By the way, I, I try to make a point of saying this each time, even though I know pretty much everybody on here knows me. But uh, I'm Anthony Gerby. I'm with Stein Financial Group, financial advisor now for about 10 years with the group. And you've got contact information there. It'll be there again at the end. If there is a question you have that you don't really want to bring up in front of the group, or maybe it's so specific to you, first off, I would, if you're comfortable with it, I would encourage you to ask it now because odds are if you're thinking it, somebody else is too. But if it's like, hey, I just want to talk to you one-on-one -on -one about it, Anthony, great. Then get in touch with me and, uh, and we will do that. And by the way, we will have a replay of this event uh, for you to be able to watch as well. Or if you have, you know, a friend or your spouse couldn't make it or anything like that, you'll be able to go back through this. So I already talked about questions are welcome. Here's our agenda today. We're going to review, look back to the first half, and we'll actually look back a little bit further. We're going to talk about what we see coming forward, looking ahead to the second half. Where are we as of right now? And um, so market forces looking ahead. And then what do we actually think will happen going ahead? And I, I'll tell you right now, there's going to be a few pages here where you're going to look and a chart is going to get flashed up on the screen. And for those of you who love that, I'm kind of one of those people. That's great. You're going to immediately kind of get, lean in and say, ooh, what is that saying? Um, I'm going to do my very best to translate the jargonese that will be up on the screen into actual digestible points, because oftentimes that's really the art of this is reading a chart in a way people can understand. So I, what I'm saying is don't get too intimidated by that, or at least I will help you not be intimidated by that. So before I dive into the actual content here, I wanted to kind of, I guess, set out a thesis statement here. And the thesis statement is this, where we are right now, economically speaking, financially speaking, as a country, let's say. So I'm not putting the politics into the mix yet. I'm just saying, if you look at really just the bare bones of the fundamentals, the things I went to school for, have, getting my degree in economics, everything seems decent. Some things seem pretty good. Some things are kind of iffy, but you average that out and you get to a decent, okay? 
But I believe that where we are today is on the precipice of what our next five or 10 years could look like. Now, that's that's a weird thing to say. What do I mean by that? So I'm going to draw some comparisons here, looking back historically for a second. In the, in the 2000s, 2000 to 2010, you'll often hear that decade called the lost decade because it started with the dot-com bust and it had 2008 and the Great Recession towards the end of it. And the lost part of the lost decade was, you know, if you look at the stock market as your barometer, which is a barometer we often use, and you look at what it did, it really didn't do very much when you just look at the start point and the end point of that decade. Right. And I'm going to be loose with the term decade because sometimes it doesn't fit exactly into a 10 calendar year period, but roughly 10 years. So from the dot com boom and then bust and then 2008, we had a big wave up and then a big wave down and then a big wave up and then a big wave down. And that sort of just looks like we're kind of treading water. And that's why they call it the lost decade. Again, I could go deeper into that, but I just wanted to set that up. Following that, the 2010s, and this is the part that I really think is, is not talked about very much. I think there is a good chance that we look back at the 2010s that we've just been through, ending with, let's say, the pandemic was the end of that decade, um, as one of the best economic decades in American history. Not just for how the market did, because the market did incredibly well. It was one of the best 10-year runs in the history of our stock market. And it didn't necessarily feel like that going through it, I think, because I was here for a lot of that. And I know it didn't necessarily feel like that all the time. But I think there is a chance that looking back, we will look at the 2010s like we do the booms of the 90s, pre-dot-com bust or even potentially the boom post-war in the 50s. Just if you look at the raw numbers, you take the emotion out of it, because obviously we just lived through that period and we've got connections to all of it. And we know what it felt like to be there. But once we get past that a little bit, I think we're going to look back and say, wow, that was a great decade uh, in, in terms of, again, just the raw numbers part of it that I tune into so much. And where I'm going with this is this. Just like coming out of the dot-com bust, we had this period of growth. We thought, hey, we're back on track, back on track, back on track. And then the 2008 recession hit. We are now coming out of this post-pandemic period where we recovered from the pandemic. That was end of 20 and 21. We took our lumps for how we recovered. That was 22 when we had to raise interest rates because inflation took off like crazy. So we took our lumps. And now inflation's coming down, and there's a big question, and we're going to talk about this, whether we can hit this soft landing, so to speak. In other words, land the plane of the economy without skidding to a crash or without having to just juice it up and take, try to take off again artificially, which then could lead to future problems down the road. Can we, can we do a soft landing, a gentle touchdown, and set ourselves up for another five being conservative, but 10 years of really solid growth, like we saw in the 2010s. That's not to say everything's perfect. That's not to say that I'm not looking back at the 2010s and saying, wow, if I could just carbon copy that, I would. But I think looking back, it's going to look a lot better in hindsight than maybe it might feel like it was while we were going through it. Because investment returns were pretty good. Interest rates were low, but the economy was doing really well. And what I see as the challenges going forward are this, and this is what's going to determine. So this is why I say 2024 into 2025 now, we're right on the precipice. We're about to chart the new course, set the new trend. You know, I'm kind of using some buzzwords because there's no official mechanism for this. It's just about where we're going. But I see a few headwinds and a few tailwinds, or at least things we need to think about. So the next 10 years to me, I know this is just about the halftime update, so I'm not making promises about the next 10 years, but I really do think this is a year of transition is what I'm getting at. Can the growth trajectory we're on withstand the politics and the geopolitics and the technological disruptions, right, that we're, we're facing now, but are probably only going to escalate from here to some extent? Can we weather that storm? Can we control our interest rates in a way that brings inflation down so that prices aren't growing by leaps and bounds every year without sending too many people to the unemployment line? These are the questions that the people in Washington, D.C., on Wall Street in New York, and literally all of us with 
we're all contributors to the economy, we're going to answer in the next years. And I'm not trying to say there's like a, there's a deadline where we all have to send in our ballot for how the next 10 years are going to go. Um, but I think what has happened this year will be incredibly telling for where we are going and what will happen for the second half of this year will be the same way. So there's my thesis statement. Thank you for kind of sticking with me on that. What I want to do now is get into the numbers and actually talk about where we are. I'm going to get a little nuts and boltsy, but I promise I'll loop it back into that thesis that I just went through here. So this is the first half of the year. And this is the stock market, the S&P 500. So I'm going to say stock market a lot. I'm going to, again, this is me translating the terms here. The S&P 500 is actually just the largest 500 stocks in the U.S. stock market. And I just use the S&P as my, in, uh, my um, proxy for the entire market. Is it the entire market? No, it's not. There's many, many thousands of other companies that make up the stock market, but this is a good barometer of where we're going. I know that's review for some of you, but I just try to say that every time because I think sometimes it can be really easy to get carried away with jargon in these things. So here's where we've been. 2024, by the way, look at the shape of the line. Before you read any of the bubbles, there, I've got the disclaimer above my head over here. Just look at the shape of the line. It's up and to the right. Now, is it straight up and to the right? Absolutely not. No, and it probably will never be that way. But it is up and to the right. And that's the direction we want things to go. We want it to go up and to the right. So a couple of things from this year just worth highlighting. December CPI increases to 3.4%. Market drops a little bit. What is CPI? CPI is called the Consumer Price Index. It's just how we measure inflation. So when you see CPI, think inflation, think prices are going up at this rate. Well, in February, it was 3.4. That was a little higher than we thought it was going to be, so the market dropped a little bit, but recovered right away, pretty much. March 20th, the Federal Reserve signals that they will possibly cut interest rates three times this year. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, that ain't going to happen. They've already revised those assumptions. But that's what we kind of thought in March, and everybody felt pretty good about that. So the market went up a little bit more. April 15th. Now, this makes it seem like the GDP number is what caused the market to drop in April. That's not really true. The GDP number came in just fine. GDP is a measure of how fast our economy is growing, our whole country, um, not just the stock market. Really, it's untied from the stock market. 1.6 is not great, but it's not terrible either. And a lot of people, I've told this story a hundred times in the past couple of weeks, because I just think with a year getting halfway through, it's a good time to reflect. Um, I was sitting in a conference in November of last year, and they had four uh, representatives of large financial firms. JP Morgan was there, Capital Group American Funds was there, and there were a couple of others as well. And they had not necessarily their chief economist, but somebody on their basically prediction team, their economic team. And it was a panel. So they were getting asked questions. And the last question was, what do you think is going to happen in 2024? And all of them to a person said recession, 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 recession. Now they all said small recession. So, you know, uh, not like a 2008, they all said recession. We have not been in a recession this year. It's not looking like we're going to be. Obviously the future can't be totally predicted, but for a recession to happen, we would need to see this GDP number turn negative. That's what helps define a recession. So the fact that it was positive, even at just 1.6%, that's pretty decent overall from where they thought we were going to be. I'm going to get to some predictions here in a second that were really wrong. Um, and then finally, core inflation slows to lowest in three years. Basically, the story here is inflation has been coming down, not in a straight line by any means. But we do believe that interest rates will be able to be cut by next uh, by this year. Actually, we believe September will be the first cut um, in interest rates with more following after uh, in 2025. So uh, I'll get to that in more detail in a second. Just, you know, this is a little bit unfair because you can always look back and find people who got it wrong. But this is a tradition of this presentation. So I, I keep running with it. These were the forecasts for the value of the S&P 500 at the end of this year. So I know it says 2023 S&P 500 tar target. These were the predictions made in 2023 for where we would end 2024 at, okay? And don't worry about what this number means, just know that higher is better, okay? So we started the year 
at about 4,600 in terms of where the where the uh, S&P 500 was at. And you can see the predictions, right? Some of them thought we'd break 5,000, uh, but the most aggressive prediction here only predicted an increase of 7% in the market for the entire year, okay? Now, the year's not over, so they might come back and say, hey, we're not wrong yet. But as of May 31st, the market was at 5,277 above everybody's year-end projections, or at least these people's year-end projections. And I, these firms are good at what they do. So I'm not saying that, well, these are schmucks here. These, these people are smart. Does anybody want to take a guess without cheating where the market's at today? Because uh, I have the May 31st number up on the screen, but I've got it to the side here where it's literally live trading right now because the market's open. Um, if you do, you can put it in the chat and see if you're right. I'm not, I'll, I'll just tell you the answer, though. It's more a rhetorical question. Um, today, right now, I'm looking at it live. The market is at 5646 and 57 cents. So it has gone up another 400 almost points from where it ended in May, just to literally live today. Now, that number literally just changed again by a couple cents. So, you know, you'll, you'll Google it later today and it'll be slightly different from that. I'm literally looking at the live track number. But my point is, we're blowing away these firms' expectations. And that speaks to what I heard at that conference at the end of the year, um, where everybody thought, oh, it might be a recession this year. I don't know how well the market's going to do. The market's done really well this year, way better than anybody expected, way better than I expected. So I, I want myself sort of with this group, although I didn't think there was going to be a recession. But um, but hey, that's great. That's kind of along the lines of when I'm saying we're setting the trend for the next five, 10 years. This year being so good gives me more confidence that going forward, again, nothing ever happens in a straight line, but that we will be good going forward. So again, we're going to look back a little bit here. Uh, first, I want to point out the, uh, over this shoulder, the date, 2022. This is not right now. This is, we call these our speedometers. This is just done by a company that sort of tracks all these numbers. And you can see all the different categories. I'm not going to go through them all. What we care about is, are things looking positive on whatever factor we're looking at? Are they neutral? So there's good news and bad news. Or are they, and things aren't going well, they're in the red. And this was January, 2022. Now, you may remember 2022 ended up being a pretty bad year for the market. The market was down 20% for the year. Bonds were down too. So we felt more of that. And everybody who was coming into my office, all of you were saying, what do we do about this? And I said, look, it's the toughest thing you can do sometimes, but often the best thing we can do is just ride this out because we do believe better news is happening. But I want to go back and just show you at the beginning of that year, everything looked pretty good. So we were all fairly optimistic about it. Where did we get by the start of this year, 2024? Uh, it's a little dicier, right? Now, 2023 ended up being a great year. We did recover. So everybody who stuck it out and held through that 2022 period, you were rewarded for it, which is exactly what we hoped would happen. But it's nice to see that it does happen. Um, but starting this year, this is why some people were pessimistic. Look at the dials. And I know these dials feel unscientific, but there are real numbers backing them up, right? So we weren't quite sure where this year was going to go. I was somewhat optimistic. I think others were somewhat pessimistic and probably the average was right in the middle there. So where are we today or at the end of June? Things have gotten better. Now, I would argue if I was in charge of the, these dials and maybe by the end of July, they'll have it updated. Political environment down here in the bottom right corner uh, I would maybe dial that one to a red. I think our politics has really gotten crazy in the past couple of weeks here, um, not in, including this Saturday with the horrific events in Pennsylvania, but also um, even going back to the the debate and all the the, um, the I guess the news oxygen that's being used up on that burning fire. But regardless, what I want to tell you is from the start of this year, January to June, things have gotten better. And that's where I'm starting to see this trend that if if it could continue, and that's always an if, but if it could continue, we could be setting ourselves up for a good long period of growth. Maybe not incredible growth, but growth nonetheless. And that's ultimately what we'd hope for. Um, here's one of those charts that I warned you about. Uh, don't worry too much about this. I'll explain it. It is tracking corporate earnings 
and it's it's using earnings per share and share is what you think it is it's literally per share of ownership that exists in the stock market the point here is that as corporate earnings do well the stock market tends to do well now the okay that makes sense anthony but sometimes it's good to just kind of restate our uh our parameters here i guess and what i want to point out is a, how closely these two lines match each other. Not perfect by any means. There is no perfect predictor of the stock market. But this is one of the better ones. And if earnings are set to increase, not profits again, just earnings. Profits are a different conversation. That's where it gets kind of political when you talk about corporate profits. But just earnings, they're trending upward right now. And that's usually a good sign for the economy and for the stock market. So that gives us a little confidence. That's why some of these dials have turned green from the orange they started the year at. Next, inflation, all right? Now, inflation, we can compare it to what it was 12 months ago. That's the chart on, well, this chart, the yellow one. Or we can compare it to what it was last month. And this does not have the July numbers, which actually show, or excuse me, the June numbers, which actually show that inflation dropped, not just increased slower, but actually dropped in the last month. Um, and basically what we've seen is, again, no straight lines exist in this world, but inflation in general is getting closer to what the Federal Reserve wants it to be, which is 2%. Now, I think it's gonna be a little while before we get there, they do too. I don't think we're getting there this year, for example. But I do think we will continue to drop to get closer to 2%. And there was just an article, I wanna say it was yesterday, it might've been over the weekend, but I think it was yesterday, where the chair uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell had said, we don't need interest, or excuse me, inflation to drop below 3% in order to cut rates. That to me is as strong a signal as you can possibly get that interest rates are going to go down in September. I'll believe it when I see it, but it's certain what they want to do. Whether they will actually do it, whether new data will come in, that's what all we're waiting on, I think, at this point. So this is overall good. Now, you see some blips. March, everybody talked about March because inflation ticked up a little bit, and everybody said, whoa, 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 what happened? Well, if this chart were a little bit longer, this one uh, right here, meaning goes a little bit further to the past, you would see that March of 2023 was a weirdly low month. For inflation it sticks out amongst all its peers and why i bring that up this is what makes me laugh about kind of the the way these things are covered in the media so everybody got freaked out inflation's at 3.5 percent what it was at 3.2 percent just a month ago it's going up again oh no oh no we we can't cut rates we might have to raise rates Th those conversations were had back in march and i just went and looked at the graph and said yeah but what this chart is really showing is Year over year inflation, I can't get my hand, my screen cuts off. Although you look at the title, year over year. What does that mean? That means compared to one year ago. Well, maybe, maybe it's not that this March was a weirdly high number. Maybe it's that last March was a weirdly low number. And by comparison, it makes it look higher. That's a weirdly technical point that I can see why the media is like, yeah, that doesn't sell newspapers, Anthony, your, your explanation of that. But when it went down again the next month and it's gone down again since then, I think that's what it was. It was just a quirk of the data. So I think sometimes we get bent out of shape about this stuff. Maybe we, I'll use the media to be the scapegoat there. When it's really just kind of a quirk, I guess, of the data. So anyway, there's my little soapbox there. Um, this is called labor market snapshot. What I want you to focus on, I'm going to move my head back over here because it's right, right here, this gray line, and then where it meets up, again, my hand's cut off, with that orange line. The gap between those two lines is the current amount of job openings we have in this country. Or in other words, job openings in excess of people looking for jobs. We have still millions of jobs open in this country that are not being filled. And our unemployment rate is back to the historic lows it was pre-pandemic. That's sort of not been covered a lot. The unemployment rate really recovered extremely quickly from the pandemic. And we are at historic 50-year lows in unemployment. That does not mean that people aren't losing their jobs in places. People absolutely are. We are seeing people get laid off from big uh, big corporations, especially. 
the good news, and this is why I feel optimistic about that in the long run, it's never good when people lose their jobs. Um, and, you know, that, so I'm, I'm not trying to sugarcoat that. But what is better now than like a 2008 scenario, for example, those people have jobs they can then land in once they lose the first job, okay? In 2008, when people lost the job, they landed on the unemployment line. They landed, uh, it's not a line anymore, but they landed on the unemployment list, right? And there were no good jobs for them to get. There are good jobs for these people who are getting laid off to land in. And I think the unemployment rate will continue to be low. And here's, here's I'm going to do my best to make this case to you, and you'll see if you agree with me or not. Um, let's see if I have a good slide to cue this up. Uh... You know what? I'm just going to go here. I'll go back to the ones I just skipped, but I want to focus on this headline right above my head. Will the Fed cut interest rates? Here's something that's not being talked about at all. Um, and I've made this case to a few people, and I think it's why interest rates will almost certainly, as sure as I can be about anything, come down next year at the latest. Here's why. When the pandemic hit, our response as a country was stimulus. We wanted to stimulate the economy by cutting interest rates and making money just fly around like crazy, right? That's why we ended up getting the inf inflation we did. But that's that was the first thing we did. We cut interest rates to zero. Well, what does everybody do when we cut interest rates? What do you do? You probably thought about, if you have a mortgage still, refinancing your mortgage and getting the best interest rate of your lifetime, probably. Well, would it surprise you to learn that corporations think the same way? They say, hey, we have debt. Interest rates are at all-time lows. They're as low as they could possibly be. Let's refinance our debt. That's what a lot of places did. Now, just like you, when you refinance your mortgage, they're going to get some options. They're going to get term length options, meaning how long till they have to repay that debt or what's the term of the payment. For mortgages, obviously, most of us know primary is 30 years. You can certainly get 10 years or five years or 15 if you kind of price around and see what the best rate for you. And it depends on how much debt you're taking out and all that stuff. Same thing for them. But commonly in the corporate world, five years is sort of the magic number, okay? For various reasons. Well, if I look at the calendar, the pandemic happened in 2020, which means most people refinanced in 2020, maybe early 2021. Five years from 2020 is 2025. What's going to happen? They have this new debt on the books that they, it's not new debt that they took out, but they refinanced their old debt for a dirt cheap interest rate. That helped stimulate the economy because they didn't have to just cut jobs in order to cut costs. But interest rates have gone up significantly since 2020, right? So now what all these corporations are looking at is, hey, we've got in one year, We've got to refinance our debt again. We, we, we don't have the wherewithal to just pay it back. We have to refinance again. But we're going to have to refinance at 6 7% interest versus 1 2% maybe. I'm picking those numbers out of thin air, but that illustrates the point. Um, that means we got to cut costs by 5% in order to just make our interest rate payment now. That's why you're starting to see some layoffs. And that's why the Federal Reserve among other reasons, inflation is coming down. I'm not trying to soft sell that, but that's why the uh, Federal Reserve is going to cut interest rates because they know if they don't, these companies are going to start laying people off, big companies, big corporations. And I'm speaking generally, don't get me wrong, every company is different, but more large companies will have to start laying off more people if interest rates stay higher. And the Federal Reserve is weighing that versus what might happen to inflation if we cut interest rates. And we're trying to hit thread that needle. That's that's the soft landing we're talking about. We're trying to thread it so that we cut interest rates fast enough that we don't have massive unemployment, but slow enough that inflation can keep running down. And that is an incredibly hard tightrope to walk. Don't get me wrong. So will they get it perfect? I, I doubt. I doubt we'll get it perfect. But we've been doing pretty well so far is my point. And that doesn't mean we'll do it perfectly. That doesn't mean we'll get it right. But that's what this chart tells me. So hopefully that sort of made sense. Um, I think that's a really under talked about story when it comes to interest rates is the level of debt in this country that our corporations have puts 
a burden on that. And we can talk about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. You might be sitting there thinking, oh my God, you know, just what a nightmare. Um, I don't think it's going to be a nightmare, but it, it, whether we like it or not, it's reality. So we still have to deal with it is kind of my, my point there. So consumer sentiment, I'll go through this really quickly. This is a very famous, very widely used University of Michigan survey that they do. And it's literally basically a survey, kind of like a presidential poll that just asks how they feel about the economy. And it drills down deeper than that. It's not just blanket. How do you feel about the economy? It's a good survey. Um, and a lot of people really use it for, hey, if sentiment's good, usually the economy being good follows that. So you see the peaks and the troughs. By the way, these little highlighted uh, lighter gray sections, those are recessions that we've had throughout the past. I mean, this goes all the way back to the 60s here, actually to the 50s even. Um, but you can see that it's trending upward on this far right side, right above my head right now. That's what we care about. Things are seeming to go in a better direction than they were. All right, we've reached our first AI slide. Now, a lot of people have asked me about this, but here's what I think about AI in general. And I, I want to use some a, a term, a, a phrase that you're going to hear and you're going to get a little nervous when I say it. And I'm going to tell you it's not as bad as this is going to make you think, okay? I've set you up for it. I'm going to use the term .com when I describe AI. Now, immediately, what you probably thought of was the dot-com boom and then the dot-com bust, right? Here's why I make that comparison. I don't think we're headed for a dot-com bust. And I'll, I actually have a slide specifically explaining why later. But let me just explain what I mean. AI is a new technology built off old technology. It's built off the use of the internet and you know our chips getting better and better in these language learning models and neural networks and that sort of thing, software what we do really well in this country. Um, but it is a new technology and nobody, the uh, the government, you or I, or nobody knows exactly how it's going to change our lives. But it does seem like it is going to change our lives. And I would make the comparison back to the internet, okay? I'm not saying this is gonna be the same as the internet. I'm certain it won't be the exact same. But when the internet came on, everybody saw the potential. And I think that's exactly where we are right now. There's so much potential. There's unbelievable potential, both good and bad, right? And that was true of the internet too. And the internet, we can all look back now and say the internet absolutely changed our lives. You know how I know? I'm doing this presentation on the internet right now, right? You're logged into a computer or your phone or a tablet, and you're watching me via the internet or cell service, but same thing. So... Internet changed our lives dramatically. AI has that potential. Absolutely it does. But does anybody know the extent and the speed that that potential is going to materialize? Nobody does. You will not convince me right now that anybody does. I think there are going to be people right now that we can look back on in 10 years and say, wow, they really had it right. But they, they're they probably just lucky at this point. You know, maybe it's an educated guess, but their guess just happened to be right. And that gives me caution where I'm going with this. It gives me caution to say, look back at the dot-com era where every website, as long as you had a dot-com at the end, went up like crazy in the stock market, every company. I do think that we there is a good chance that we may be overestimated. I'm using we, the royal we, the stock market, Wall Street we may be overrating how quickly this is going to happen. It is going to happen quick, I believe. But I don't think we're going to be living in an entirely different world a year from now. It might be five years. It might be 10 years. Look at the way the internet rolled out. The internet starts in the 90s, but social media doesn't come along until late 2000s. The internet was around this whole time, and it was making a huge difference, and it was, it was having a big impact. But think about how much it accelerated as the other parts of the technological world caught up to it. So I'm no technologist. I'm not an expert, certainly in AI or even in market, uh, in microchips or anything like that. And this is a very complex web that we could do an entire hour on just that. But I do look with caution at the way the markets have been valuing some of these companies that are tied to AI and saying, is it seems like it's too good to be true, it, at least to the extent that it's grown, just that the 
magnitude of the growth is too good to be true. And that makes me cautious. And especially given that my job a lot of the time is working with well, all of you, but people who are not in a position to speculate on the market, not, you know, I, speculating is is really getting uber risky in order to reap these massive returns. Hey, that'd be great. But a lot of times you can try that and crash and burn too. And my job is to at all costs, prevent the crash and burn, right? That's one of the things that I see myself as being responsible for. So that leads me to dip a toe in the water. I, I, I don't think there's any harm in that. Maybe an ankle in the water for some people, depending on how risky you are. But I think the people who are diving in head first are very, let's be charitable and say that they are very aggressive investors, right? I don't think AI is going to crash and burn. But a couple of years ago, we were having conversation about NFTs, for example. Haven't heard a ton about NFTs lately. A lot of that stuff really didn't pan out. Some of it, some of it did. Maybe it'll come back. But a lot of it didn't. I think AI is much more solid than something like an NFT. So I don't want to make that my perfect comparison. But I think nobody, including the companies that are offering these AI products right now, nobody knows what it's going to look like in five or 10 years. And that's really exciting. And it's easy to get swept up in that. But it's also a potential recipe for a really choppy experience. So my two cents on AI, I'm going to come back to AI because I want to go back into the point that I made about using .com as my comparison. But let me let me push forward here. So some headlines I was already on the screen. Will we hit that soft landing? Will the Fed cut rates and AI expands its reach? I kind of covered some of that already. So what looking ahead, what are we actually looking at here? Uh, these are projections. These are the Federal Reserve's projections. By the way, I don't necessarily think the Federal Reserve is better at projecting this than anybody else. Um, I would say they're about as good as the best people. So uh, that's not necessarily a ringing endorsement, but I don't believe anybody can really predict this stuff far out with a high degree of accuracy, myself included. But what I see here, and this is based off real numbers. So again, this goes back to my original thesis of what are we setting ourselves up for? What could the next you know, half decade, decade look like? It looks like we're going to be at moderate growth, moderate, moderate to low, I would argue. It, the most probable scenario, according to the Fed, is that we grow between one and a half and two and a half percent a year. That's about where we were in the 2010s, by the way, which was a great time for the market. So I think we should all look at that and say, eh, maybe I'll take that, okay? That's that's what I see when I look at it. Unemployment. They are predicting that unemployment next year is going to continue to be at historic lows. Basically, anything under 4% is pretty historically low. We were down in the 3.5, 3.4 range um, for a while, and that is like genuinely 50-year lows. But anything under 4 is great. So if we stay in that range, which they do believe we will, I, I call that a win as well. And then core PCE inflate, inflation. All right. Um, it just don't even worry about what PCE means. It's another index. It's a way to track whether prices are going up or down. Are prices going to go up more or less? Or what's the growth rate going to be? They do believe that they uh, will, inflation will stay slightly higher for slightly longer. And by slightly higher, I mean, we're in the between 2 and 3% versus lower than 2%. Again, I'm throwing these numbers out at you. This stuff genuinely, if I could lock what's on this screen in, if I could make that reality right now for 2025, I think I would probably take it, right? If it was a take it or leave it thing, obviously that's not how it works, but I'm just for the hypothetical here. Um, how long will inflation stick around? Sticky price CPI, I'm not even gonna get in. That's a, that's a, tech, it's a technical term. It sounds like I'm just trying to make this less jargony, but sticky prices are an economic concept. And the idea is, I think inflation in the 3% to 4% range is going to be here probably through, if I had to guess, I don't think we're going to get below 3% even by the end of next year. Now, I'd be surprised if it goes back up over 4%. So I think 3 to 3.5% 3 for the short term, next 18 months, let's call it, is kind of the normal that we'd expect. And that's what the projections are looking like as well. So, you know, nobody knows for sure. If they did, they could make a killing by predicting it. But 
um, I think that in general is where we're at. So where what's ahead for rates? I talked about this before. There is a meeting where they could, in theory, cut interest rates this month. I highly doubt that is going to happen. Okay, it's in a couple of weeks they have a meeting. Everybody, everybody is circling other side, Anthony. This meeting right here, September 17th and 18th. That is the consensus opinion on when rates are going to get cut. Now, it's probably only going to be a cut by a quarter of a percent. So let me explain kind of, I'm not going to explain the mechanism unless somebody's really interested in that. Um, but what that means, that means you should probably see CD rates dropping by a little bit in September. You should probably see mortgage rates dropping by a little bit. And I'm talking like a quarter of a percent. So not like it's going to go from, hey, I can get a CD at 5% today, but I can only get it at 3% in September. No, you're probably going to be able to get four and a half, four and three quarters would be my guess. Um, but it should drop. Now, a year from now is when I think a big difference will be made. I think right now, when you can get a CD for 5%, let's say for a year, and I'm just picking on CDs because that's an easy example. Um, this will affect most, if not all, interest rates in our economy. but you can get a CD right now for about 5% for a year, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, depends on where you go, all that stuff. A year from now, I think it's going to be closer to 3% for the for the year going forward after that, okay? Now that's, I'm just picking a number. That's what the projections are that we're going to be in the three to three and a half percent interest rate range. That's not a certainty. There is no guarantee that, that happens, but that's what we're projecting here. So just to kind of translate it into a real life thing. And what this means is, and a lot of you have heard me talk about this in the last six months, when interest rates go down, bond prices go up and vice versa. So what this really should be showing, I don't worry about the terms yield and prices. What this teeter-totter is showing, when interest rates go up, bond prices go down. That's what's on the screen right now. That's what happened in 2022. That's why our bonds didn't do well in 2022. By reverse, when interest rates go down, bond values go up. So for everybody on this call and for people I've met with recently, what we've been doing is making sure that you're in the best position to benefit from what we see as, as close to a certainty as possible, that rates are going to go down. So it's a good thing for our investments, too, that interest rates are going to go down in general. There's always cause and effect here. I don't want to oversimplify it, but I do want to simplify it. So you can tell I'm kind of walking that, that tightrope there. So we're going to stay focused on the fundamentals as we always do. Here's what I want to show you. Now, again, small chart, small print, weird graphics here. The yellow part of what you're looking at are bull markets. Bull markets are markets where the market goes up, more or less. There's actually a technical definition, but just think about it as up markets. Bear markets are periods where the market goes down, okay? And you can see the gold periods are, A, much wider than the light gray periods on the downside. The average bull market lasts many times longer than the average bear market, which is good. And where are we right now? I'll put my head right next to it. Ongoing. We're in a bull market right now. Why I wanted to include this in here. This is where we could be headed for the next five or 10 years. We could be in a period like this, where my head is right now. This is the 2010s. This was that great decade, 11 years up 400%. We could be headed towards a period like the 90s, where it was 12 years and almost up 600%. Unbelievable, the late 90s were. Again, this is why I think we're going to look back on this period in the 2010s and really compare it to the 90s as well. Wow, what a great period. And here's that lost decade I talked about. Dot-com bust here, great recession here, bear, uh, bull market in the middle, but it was kind of bookended by two bad events, right? Where are we going to go from here? I believe, and this goes back to that thesis I laid out at the very beginning, I do believe that we are set up to have another good run. Maybe it's a five-year run. Maybe it's a 10-year run. I'm sure it's not going to be in a straight line. So don't get me wrong. There'll be a year that's down in there somewhere. Maybe two years that are down. There were years that were down slightly in this period. But on the whole, it was a good long period. And I, I am cautiously always, but cautiously optimistic 
that the numbers that we're seeing right now could be leading us to that. So I, I don't want to oversell it. Don't take me as somebody who's saying, sell your house, mortgage your house and put it all in the market right now. Absolutely not. Don't do that. But going forward, coming out of a 2022 period, which is this, this part right here, right above my head, uh, I do think we've got good things on the horizon. So let me let me go to this and um, I'm going to take one step back after this and then I'll let you go. And if you've been eating lunch while I've been talking good or if you haven't, go get some lunch after this. This is an AI slide. I've got some weird little lines on here. What are these weird little lines? Investing fads since 1977. I could take you through all of them. All of them kind of have their interesting little ins and outs, right? Gold in the 70s when stagflation was coming on and everybody was like, hey, maybe gold is the best store of value again. And then it sort of went back to normal. It went up like crazy, went back to normal. Japan in the late 80s when everybody thought Japan was going to take over the world. You tell, By the way, you tell younger people about that and they're like, everybody thought Japan was going to take over the world. It's like, well, maybe not take over the world, but yeah, they did in the 80s when Japan was really on the rise. And then that crashed back down. And then Asia in general, and then the internet housing, China, biotech, Fang. I hate that they included Fang in this. I did not make this slide. Fang is an acronym for the biggest five stocks in the stock market. So those five stocks were taken off like crazy. And then, you know, I'd say that's still a fad, but it's not as big as it was. And all the way at the bottom here is AI, okay? And this is what tells me that we are not close to a dot com, which is the internet, the light blue line here. We are not yet close to a dot com bust happening, or at least in terms of historical precedence, we are not in this crazy bubble. You know, bubble is a term that everybody likes to use because I think it makes us all sound smart, right? And it's a bubble is something that grows until it gets so big that its own structure can't support itself and it pops and then every you lose everything. And yeah, you can describe the internet uh, bubble as a bubble. Sure, people have, people will continue. I think that's fair. We're not there yet with AI. So that's what I, why I'm saying we've still got room to go, even though I totally agree that nobody knows how this is going to play itself out. And maybe we are getting a little ahead or leaning a little ahead on our skis. I don't think we're over our skis yet. And that's what this chart tells me. So uh, hopefully that makes you feel a little better. That's the end of my um, slides. But I want to go back here because there's these are the only slides, these speedometers, I'm going to put my head right below it, that talk about politics here. I'm going to put my life in my hands and talk about politics for a second right now. All right. And here, here's how I talk about it. You all know I try to be pretty apolitical. And I think the market is fairly apolitical. So it works out uh, that that's germane to the conversation. But let me, let me go through this for a second. Going into the year, we had a strong conviction. And it's a conviction I still have that the market does not necessarily need one candidate, President, uh, former President Trump or President Biden to win this election. And here's what I mean by that specifically. Regardless of who wins, I think what we could see going into the fall is a period of real uncertainty in the market right before the election, especially if it turns out to be a very close race. Um, it's seemingly getting a little less close right now with the way the polls are, but there's still four months to go. So I'm not going to call anything right now. So let's assume it's a close race that could cause the markets to jump up and down easily, I think. And by the way, that has to do with the House and the Senate elections as well. So it's not just all about White House, but post election. And I say this regardless of whether it would be a reelect for President Biden or I guess a different reelect, I guess you'd call it that for President Trump and not a, no, he's not the incumbent, but you know what I mean? Either one, I think the market probably goes up after the election because at least we know who's in the chair and we know who's where in Congress too, which really makes a difference. That is what happened both in 2020 and in 2016, that pattern differently, especially in 2020 differently because we were in the midst of pandemic recovery. But both of, that trend happened both in 2016 and 2020. Obviously, both our current candidates ran in both those elections. So in general, I feel fairly optimistic that the election, at least once it's over, 
will be a good thing for the market, which I think seems counterintuitive right now because that's because of all the chaos. So with the recent developments, and I'm talking post-debate, where there's been talk about uh, Biden potentially stepping down or being replaced on the ticket. And then obviously with this crazy uh, assassination attempt on uh, former President Trump at his rally on Saturday, everything is way up in the air. Now, what's not up in the air is it seems like President Trump will continue to be the nominee. And I'll believe it when I see it for President Biden not being the nominee is kind of where I'm at. That's just me personally. I'm not making a prognostication about that. But um, I do believe that if things stay as the status quo as they are right now, we're probably still in for a good time with the market. If we do get a new candidate on the Democratic side, uh, let's say President Biden does pull out of the race, and I'm not even going to make a prediction about who that could be. We all know what's bouncing around in the news these days. Um, If it's a new candidate, I could see a short term period of the market kind of adjusting their expectations to it. But at the end of the day, long term, I don't think it'll make a huge difference market wise. Okay. And by the way, I don't know what would have happened if Trump's rally on Saturday was during a weekday while the market was open. That may have caused more chaos. But the market opened up yesterday after an assassination attempt. And that, by, by the way, that's not to say that, you know, anybody was happy about that. Um, I didn't see that story, thankfully, but that's not what that means. What that means is the market had already taken into account that he was okay by then. And they kind of said, well, you know, yeah, it's a crazy story. And yeah, it's incredibly unfortunate. And the politics part of this is a complete mess. But the business market economic piece of it, we can kind of go back to business as usual. You know, it it missed. I mean, the, the bullet didn't actually miss, but it it didn't, you know, seriously injure, which is we're all thankful for. Um And so the market, I think, kind of said, well, you know, that's pretty crazy, but we're going to keep doing our business like we were doing it. And so ultimately, where I'm coming down on this political side of things is, do I think the politics this year are going to be a huge distraction? Well, yeah, they already are. And not to say they're not important. Distraction maybe isn't the right word, because that this is an important election for many different people on many different sides. Again, I'm being totally apolitical here. Um, Congress is important. It's important for the policies that we may or may not see come through in the next few years. I haven't talked about taxes at all, but that's a major issue that will be decided by the next White House and Congress where taxes are going to go from here. So there's a lot of stuff at stake. And yet the market seems to be saying we feel okay about all the possible outcomes and what we really care about, we being the market again, is just knowing where the chips are going to fall come November. So I see a little volatility before that. And then I see a recovery from that volatility and making it all back and more through the end of the year. Um, That could change. If we get a new candidate, the market really doesn't like them. Well, maybe my opinion will be updated. All this is subject to change as politics seems to be these days anyway. But I wanted to address that because we didn't have a particular slide. Kind of when this presentation was created, it was sort of a sleepy campaign. Um, you know, maybe it didn't quite feel like that, but it seemed like, well, we all know who the players are. Well, let's just get to November and count the votes and be done with it. And in the past just two weeks here, basically, that has almost completely flipped on its head. Now it's one of the most, you know, forgive the word, but fascinating campaigns uh, in a while. So I don't know any better than any of you where it's going. I do believe that the market, and we should all take some comfort in this, the political environment only matters so much to the market, to the economy. I'm not saying it doesn't matter, it does, but it only matters so much. And I think that is something we can take comfort in when the political environment does get crazy like it has been. So hopefully that addressed sort of the political question. I knew that was going to be something that somebody would at least have a question on. So I wanted to at least address it because it's a big topic right now. But with that, I've gotten through all my information. If anybody has any questions, I am more than happy to stick around and go through them. You can type them in the chat. You can raise your hand and we'll unmute you. Um, Whatever works. And please do that uh, now if you want. But if you've got stuff to do today, if you were waiting on me to finish to go get lunch, go do that as well. And we really appreciate all of you being here. If any of you would like to go over this stuff, you know, as it relates specifically to you, 
that is what I'm here for. Again, if if you were in the middle of typing something and I'm cutting you off, just shoot it to me in an email and we'll go over it one on one. But I really appreciate everybody being here. I hope you have a great rest of your day and we'll see you next month for uh, we're going to talk about college planning, which is kind of a new one. We haven't done that in a while. This will be really helpful for people with kids or grandkids, um, how to reduce costs going into college. It's a new uh, seminar we're doing. You'll hear all about it in the next month here or so. So thank you, everybody. Take care.